Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I, when the slides come up, you will see that. Um, I will come now with a perspective from the end user side, so how we believe quantum sensing will have an impact on um, the aerospace domain. Uh, there we go. And uh, I've chosen for you one very concrete example where you can actually nicely see um, the challenges of quantum sensors to bring them into an aerospace applications, but also the promise and also what we do at Airbus to push this forward. So I will focus on quantum sensing for to improve Earth observation from space. Uh, but before I go into those details, I would like to go one step back and first um, talk a little bit about Airbus, who we are and what we are doing exactly. So you probably know us best for our commercial aircraft. Maybe some of you have even taken the Airbus to come, come to Paris. Um, so in the middle, the small aircraft, which you see is one of our A320 family. This is a, a very important product for us. We have delivered more than 10,000 of those aircrafts to customers. We have a backlog order of about 7,000, which we will manufacture over the next years. And about every two to three seconds, uh, one of these type of aircraft is taking off uh, somewhere in the world. But yeah, but it's more than that. We are also offering a defense products. You see some of our military aircraft here on the left side. We are producing helicopters. We are actually the largest um, heli civil helicopter manufacturer in the world. Some of the products are there on top. And what you cannot see in this picture is what we do for space. So we are Europe's largest uh, satellite manufacturer. Uh, we are building a variety of satellites, Earth observation satellites, navigation satellites, telecommunication satellites. Um, but we are active along the full value chain of space. Um, so we are working also on ground segment and satellite operations. We are selling data from satellites to our customer. And we are also active in fields like space exploration, scientific missions, and also human space flight. So you see it's a quite comprehensive portfolio covering more or less the uh, the, the, the aerospace uh, 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 aerospace um, sector. And there's one thing um, our products or many of our products have in common. They have many, many sensors. Um, this is true for aircraft, as you can imagine, helicopters, and it's also true for, for example, for satellites. And the reason why we are looking into um, a quantum sensors is basically can be split into two different properties. The first one is, of course, the high sensitivity, which has some very uh, obvious uh, applications. But it turns out that for many of the use cases in aerospace, this is not the driving factor. So our sensors, they often suffer, suffer from drifts because classical sensors are drifting. When you change the environment, this is very hard to avoid. And our products, they are operating in different environments, right? The aircraft is flying at 10 kilometers. We have products in the stratosphere. We have products in space. So that's why, in particular, the low drift has a, a very important impact and leads to a variety of really interesting applications. And I, I put here some of them on the slide. This is really just a snapshot. It's not comprehensive. Um, there's a topic about navigation. I will talk about this uh, later. So this is really a very important topic as well. But quantum sensors will also help us in the future to improve our connectivity, for example, with better antennas, to improve our testing capabilities. We might have better radar and LIDAR capabilities. And it's also interesting for Earth observation in space. And this is what I would like to focus on today. And I have chosen one example where we are active and where you can nicely see this impact. This is satellite gravimetry. So using satellites to monitor the gravity field of the Earth. And maybe it's not so well known. Um, many critical processes on Earth, they, are, they affect the mass distribution. So they have a signature in their gravity. Those processes can be linked to the surface, like sea level changes, but also ocean circulation, ice melting is a very prominent example. And then, of course, interior processes, which have a signature in gravity, which are impossible to measure otherwise, like groundwater reservoirs, oil reservoirs, seismic activities, volcanoes. So this is really a very important set of applications. And that's why we already have satellite systems in orbit, which are measuring the gravity field of the Earth. So here you see a kind of a range of uh, missions since the last 20 years, which are measuring either the gravity field of the Earth or the gradient of the gravity field of the Earth. And Airbus has been pretty much involved in all of them. So it's really um, an important part of our Earth observation space portfolio. And we're also currently involved in the development of the next generation of those um, satellites. So how does it work? 
there are many methods, and I will just focus on one of them, which is called satellite to satellite tracking. So what if you want to do that, you have to place two satellites in an orbit. Typically, one chooses a rather low orbit of about 500 kilometers. And these satellites, they fly in a formation. So they have a distance of about 200 kilometers. And as you can see here on the slide, they are linked uh, with interferometry measurements, either microwave interferometry or optical interferometry. And we can detect the relative distance between those two satellites uh, on the micrometer level. So now what happens if I fly this on an anomaly in the mass? So first what happens, I have the, the, the formation approaching, and then the first satellite, seeing an anomaly, gets a pull. It's, the distance is increased. Then the second satellite also gets a little bit later also a pull, and the distance is again brought to the initial level. So basically what we are measuring is the vari are, is variations and distances, and from those variations, we can derive the gravity field of the Earth. And you can actually do this with a uh, quite amazing um, accuracy. You see here, like uh, the anomaly gravity field of the Earth, and there's quite a lot of interesting information you get out of that. And I would like to highlight uh, one of them, which is here from a from the so-called GRACE mission. This is one of those satellite missions. Uh, GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate um, Experiment Mission. This ran from 2000 to 2000, uh, 2002 to 2016. And here you see the mass changes of the ice of Greenland measured with GRACE. And there are two effects. First, you see these uh, little wobbles, which are the annual cycles, so the growth and shrinking uh, based on the seasons. And then you can also see the overall decrease of the ice mass, which we can associate uh, to uh, climate change. And you see this overall a loss of about 280 gigatons of ice per year. And over the mission lifetime was nearly 4,000 uh, gigatons of ice, which, um, which were lost. So you can see it's a really very important tool to measure uh, those effects. And if you want to measure this, you need a global observation scheme. And the only way you can achieve this is with satellites. So now the question is, why do we need quantum? Because this is all classical, and it's actually doing pretty well, as you see. Well, there's a bottleneck. And the bottleneck is that these acceleration effects, which I showed you beforehand, they are not always coming only from the gravity of the Earth. There are also other effects which lead to, ex to deceleration, for example, atmospheric drags, solar particles which are coming in. So that's why those missions typically have a very uh, uh, high-performance accelerometer on board to be able to subtract those effects. Well, today, one uses electrostatic accelerometers, which are really high-performant. The problem is it's a classical sensor, so it drifts. So if you go, for example, on the eclipse, or if you have um, space radiation, this leads potentially to some discharges. And this means on the longer time scale, so on frequencies on the uh, millihertz or 10 millihertz regime, you have a significant increase in the noise. Okay. So now if I use a quantum sensor, as I said in the beginning, quantum sensors have a very low drift. We have basically a flat noise spectrum. And the type of choice here is called atom interferometry. So to use this technology as an accelerometer. And if we manage to do this, this has a big impact. So here's a study from two years ago where you can see on the left-hand side the arrow in the gravity field of the Earth using a classical electrostatic accelerometer and then a simulation if you have a quantum-enhanced version. What you see are these funny stripes. They're actually coming from the orbit acquisition. Uh, and then it's a kind of elising effect, which is uh, uh, materializing here in the data, and which is coming from the drifts. And if you avoid those drifts, you can see on the right-hand side that basically the structure is nearly completely suppressed. So the er uh, error rate is significantly reduced. So this is what we can achieve when we manage to put such a quantum sensor into space. So how do we do that? Um, of course, uh, we are not starting from scratch. So from the first realization of ultra-cold atoms in the 90s, there was a lot of work in the direction to bring ultra-cold atoms into zero gravity. For example, here in France, um, uh, zero-G flights have been performed. So the, um, we're, we're with uh, zero gravity. Then also, uh, for example, in Germany, there were a lot of drop tower experiments where zero gravity has been achieved. 
There was a few years ago um, a mission called Mayus, where the, for the first time the Bose Einstein condensate was brought on the sounding rocket into orbit, so above 100 kilometers. There are activities to bring those uh, quantum sensors on the ISS. And the next natural step is to bring this into orbit, so on a satellite. And this is what you see on the upper, left, uh, upper right side. This is the Carioca project. This is uh, an initi initiative from the European Union. Um, to, uh, to, it's an orb in-orbit demonstrator for a quantum space gravimetry pathfinder. And this is a project um, which aims basically to realize what you see here. So you want to have a cold atom interferometer on those satellites operating in orbit. And we are working here um, together with many partners. This is a consortium led by the French Space Agency. Uh, we have academic partners, a lot of industrial partners as well. And what we are aiming here for is to bring this technology into operations, which means it needs to survive the launch of uh, the sensor needs to survive the launch. It needs to be completely autonomous for the lifetime. And it needs to survive the space environment, so space radiation, thermal stress, etc. In this project, we are developing what is called an engineering model, which means we are aiming to have, in the end, a sensor which has TL5. We are testing all critical technologies. We are preparing the industrialization. And Airbus is responsible for the instrument development. So we have here in France um, our teams who are then doing the overall integration. And we are also developing with our teams uh, in Germany um, the physics package. The physics package here is the basically the heart or the head of such a sensor where with the vacuum chamber where you have the atom chip and the atoms are basically manipulated and read out. And then you also need to combine this with a microwave source with an ICPU, so instrument control power unit, and you need, of course, the laser system to manipulate the atoms and to do the, um, the meta-interferometry. So the objective is then, in the end, to have an in-orbit, a long-track um, interferometer, uh, interferometer accelerometer. And this is only one part of the story, right? Because then you have the sensor. This is something which is currently going on. The next step is the mission. So you need to plan the mission. We just started this together with our partners uh, beginning of this year. This will be developed. And then we are planning this, um, or the, also the roadmap of the European Union is to bring such a demonstrator into orbit by the end of, the de of this decade. And this is going to be a very important step, because then you prove that this technology works, it's operational, it has also the required lifetime. And the next step is then to integrate this into a full quantum gravimetry mission, which would probably be run in the, in the 30s or uh, end of the 30s. So what you can see here is actually, I think, a very nice uh, demonstration how these properties of quantum sensors, are, in particular the low drifts, uh, provide this, let's say, exciting applications because you really will get out data of accuracy, which today we are really just unable to get from space. But there's also other applications. And I would like to, lose, uh, to use the, the last minutes of my talk to talk about another application which uses exactly the same property, namely to use it for navigation. You can imagine navigation is a very important uh, part of our system. It's crucial for safety. And safety is, in uh, aviation, always the absolute number one priority. So today, navigation depends on inertial sensors and a variety of other sensors, but also on GPS. So GPS is used in order to compensate for drifts. But there is always the risk that GPS is not available due to dead zones, due to jamming, even potentially due to spoofing. So what we are trying to do is to find alternative measures to have complementary measurements. You can, on the one hand side, improve the inertial system using quantum technology. So you would just put what, I, what we have put in space also into an aircraft. But there's another way, which is uh, using uh, quantum, which is called quantum navigation, uh, quantum magnetic anomaly navigation, based on magnetic centers like NV sensors we have already uh, heard today, which is using the Earth uh, lithospheric magnetic field which is stable, it's just coming from the anomalies of the Earth's crust, and which is stable on geological timescales. And it measures this with a very high accuracy and then compares the data which you measure to a map. So basically, you can imagine this is here the map. You are flying, you have a drift in your inertial system, and every time 
you have again found a position in your anomaly map, you can map your position back to your initial, initial trajectory. So what we are doing here is we need to have the INS. We have then what we call the position fix, so basically the magnetic map match matching. We bring this together in sensor fusion, so we need to have a very uh, sophisticated Kalman filter, and then to come up with an integrated navigation solution. We are working here on several projects, also with uh, several partners. One of them is uh, Bosch, uh, providing us with uh, the sensor hat and the University of Norway. And we are focusing in this project on commercial aviation use cases, so in particular the landing, so landing assistance for pilots. And we are looking in particular on the overall navigation performance to have the robustness which we need to certify this in the future. So to, to, what you, to conclude on this, I think it's also another interesting application which shows that quantum sensors have this very high potential, but there's also a lot we need to do. And this is maybe also one of the key messages I would like to convey, that this is nothing we can do alone, but I think it's also nothing where basically the provider of those sensing systems can do alone, but we have to collaborate here. Uh, I think we are on a quite promising path, and we are confident that we can bring the first quantum sensors into aerospace applications indeed within this decade. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a maybe a bit of a shocking question. Would it be possible to drop this whole vacuum chamber and skip right to the micro machine, MEMS, NEMS, silicon, penning trapped, and ceramic and highly integrated system with the optical lasers and anything you need, so that you could then leverage a SpaceX constellation and literally deploy a, a 200 watt centimeter size module that would actually do the whole thing without and also leveraging the ultra high vacuum of space. I don't know. You mean for the space application, for right? For the space application. So, uh, okay, another question. What is the midi bar 10 to minus nine level, uh, effective vacuum level at 500 kilometers altitude? Could you, um, you don't need a vacuum pump then, right? I think you do. Um, uh, so I just know that the, let's say the, the, the I mean, typically these uh, ultra cold atoms, atomic systems, they're operated by at 10 to the minus 11 millibar, yes. so 10 yes. to the minus 14 bar. Um, you have a lot of remaining particles, I think, yes. from in, in, uh, in this height compared to, uh, to, to what you have in UHV. So I'm quite sure that okay. this is unfortunately not an option. Okay. But, but Which is a pity, yeah, because yeah, of yeah, course yeah, it would ease a lot of problems. But at, at uh, least problems, uh, yeah. miniaturizing and use a, a micro-machine silicon trap like in some of the other... I, I yeah, I think, I, I mean, today I this is, um, I mean, w what is here, um, basically the baseline are atom chips. I mean, there's also a question of maturity because if you you basically are not able to, to start here from scratch, we're already using, um, let's say, proven technologies and make it space ready. So if I think these... Uh, oh. Uh, gravity gravitometers on Earth will improve further, then again, this is going to be a natural development to also put this into space. Right now, it's, uh, I would say, rather the standard technology which we are uh, aiming for to course. use. Mm -hmm. It was just that the timeline was so stretched to 2040, I would have thought that this type of research could learn from the quantum computing with ions and different type of atom Let, let's see, I think who are really integrating and actually do all the R&D work that can benefit also this type of uh, science. Potentially, yes. I mean, uh, the problem is always if you want to put something in space, there's very strict yes. requirements on the TIL level. And if you have a new technology, you also need to do the full package to achieve yes. the high TIL. So uh, it depends a bit. I mean, if you manage to have it as a development adaptation, it might be feasible. If you have to redesign everything, I would be careful that this is <laughs> realistic. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so you were talking about atomic atom interferometry, but now I see a diamond. So I'm just yes. curious. Ah, sorry. I'm um, here. I didn't want to put too much effort on the uh, sensors itself. So basically, um, for the space-based uh, application, we are using ultra-cold atoms. This is the machine of choice here. Um, uh, magnet. I mean, as we have heard, these NB-centered um, sensors they have huge advantages in terms of um, uh, of uh, swaps. So they're very small. They're also comparably easy and cheap. Uh, uh, also to bring them uh, into operation. 
And um, the uh, accuracy you can achieve here is, uh, is actually not the point. It's uh, also here stability is important, but also they are to the first order, um, they, they are avoid uh, drift free. Yeah? Yeah. So you're actually working with them? Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, just to, to comment on the drift tree, uh, I was curious to, to know uh, if you have some, some figures about uh, uh, stability that you require for such navigation application to, to, to enhance uh, international navigation. You mean the uh, requirements on the on the center of the magnetic field? So the yes. challenge here is uh, not so much uh, on that point. That here's a lot of challenge on the system integration and data processing. The reason is that you have the Earth magnetic field coming from the inner part of the Earth, which is quite, uh, let's say, uh, robustly possible to subtract. Then you have the anomaly field, which is already quite small in the heights where we are flying. Mm. And then you have a lot of EMI noise, electromagnetic mm. interference created by the aircraft. So the challenge is to be able to remove all the noise we have and to be able to map the signal. So the noise is much larger than the signal. So we have to have some very sophisticated methods mm. to and calibration methods to get rid of, of the noise. We have to be very careful where we place those sensors in our aircraft. Mm. And, and so then and these. Uh it's, it's much more interesting for uh, integration in, in this case. Uh, I mean, we don't really know. I would say yes, <laughs> for, naively, um, because uh, you also don't want to put, put all sensors in one place. You want to have several sensors. I mean, you're looking in, into gradients. So um, they offer a lot of flexibility. And they're, of course, I mean, much smaller and easier, I would say, also to uh, maintain, uh, for maintenance uh, compared to ultra cold atomic systems. So. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Which are, which are still very important. Huh? So they are also uh, investigated, just I like focused here on the ND part. Take one last question. Yeah, um, maybe I just uh, didn't hear it, but to uh, like the, the example of the mass decrease of the um, ice, um, what does the mass um, decrease correspond to an inter satellite distance that you have to measure? Um, so the, the it's, it's really the, the measurement principle. So if you have a decrease in ice, you have this lower gravity field. So the effect of the increase between in the distance between the two satellites will be lower because it's really, I mean, they are subsequently flying over this anomaly. So if you have uh, ice melting and the, the water distributes, right? So you just have a smaller anomaly and this is something you can measure from space. Yeah, but really the, the absolute distance that you have to detect, basically. So now they're yes. flying. Um, what's the distance, in the change in distance over such a mass? Uh, good question. So we are, we are able to measure on the micrometer basis. And it's also on that. Uh, and I think you don't even need that. It's larger. So it's on the order of tens or more. So it's, it's not just one micrometer, which is uh, changing then. But of course, it depends. It's, it's basically the, the resolution you have of your system. If you have 4,000 gigatons of ice loss, it's a big signal. Um, if you have, uh, for example, in there you can nicely see in those data, if you build, th there sometimes there are some new cities built, let's say, in the desert, and they are just emptying water reservoirs, which are not refilled, then you see it, it's a dip appearing uh, in the gravity signal. And from entanglement, you just basically hope to go be below a micrometer and then also detect slower um, masses, or is this... So entanglement is something we have not looked in here. It's really about compensating drifts in the accelerometer. This okay. is the driving effect. Mm -hmm. So it's also, you're not uh, necessarily increasing the, uh, the accuracy. So there, there are noise effects which you try to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are trying with the quantum uh, technology. Thanks. Jasper, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.